Amen. Amen. Uncle Dunks, in case you want to sing while I talk. Or... So welcome tonight to encounter some of you I haven't seen for a while. Welcome back. It's good to have you. It's good to have you. What's happening with my mic there? So uh, to those of you who try to talk to me before I get up here and I look really stressed, it's because I'm really stressed. So, so what happens every Tuesday, half of hell comes out to mess with everything possible, but it fails every week. And every week we get our stuff together and God is glorified and lives are touched. So uh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Tonight we're carrying on with part two of what it means to be filled with the Spirit. And I want to read you a verse that has impacted my life and I pray that it would impact yours. It's in Habakkuk 3 verse 2. And we're going to go through a lot of scripture tonight because I want to present so much evidence about this life that God has called for us to have. The point of that video was to show that when you are full of the Holy Spirit, you can do the impossible, you can accomplish the impossible, you can go beyond what you possibly think is, is even imaginable. This is what the Spirit of God inside of us enables us to do. Habakkuk 3 verse 2, I have heard all about you, Lord. I am filled with awe by your amazing works. In this time of our deep need, help us again as you did years gone by. And in your anger, remember mercy. What does that verse have to do with us here today? My mom raised us on these Bible stories of the Old Testament. My mom raised us hearing stories about Joshua telling the sun to stand still. My mom raised us about people who shouted and blew horns and, and walls that were thick enough to raise chariots on falling into the ground. And then we grew up and we came to church and we found out that God doesn't do that cool stuff anymore. Unfortunately, you were born in the wrong era. It's like if you wanted free love and all of that, man, you needed to be born in the 60s. And if you wanted to see God do amazing things, well, you missed it by a few thousand years. But you see what he is saying in this verse. He doesn't for one instance think that if God did it then, then he won't do it now. What he did before, he would do now because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when we pick up our Bibles and we begin to read and we read about the Holy Spirit and we read about what God did, we can say, Lord, I'm in awe of what you did. Now will you do? Now will you do? And when I read things in the Bible, I want you to know where I'm coming from. I don't read it and say, well, that was nice for them. I read it and say, how do we see this for us? I'm happy it happened for them. That's fantastic. But we need to see God today. We need to see him move today. We need his power today. And I'm not happy to leave it in Genesis and leave it in Judges and leave it in Leviticus and all these other books. I'm not happy to leave it there. Numbers, come on over here. Let's see what God can do today. Mission Impossible. Who's ever watched the movie Mission Impossible? The whole premise of the movie, are you ready for this? Pay attention or you might miss it. It's about an impossible mission. <laughs> if you understand that, you understand the movie. And the whole point is that this highly skilled, highly trained agent is going to go accomplish a mission that should be impossible. Well, my brothers and sisters, welcome to the Christian life. Mission impossible. But you see... This agent could never accomplish what he does in the movie without all his special gadgets and tricks. He's got glasses that shoot laser beams. And he's got a watch that turns into a helicopter. And all of these crazy things <laughs> that enable him to do a mission that would otherwise be impossible. Well, I want you to know that God didn't leave us empty-handed. He didn't leave our closet bare. 
He gave us something that would enable us to live out this mission and accomplish it, that by the end he can say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You did everything that I asked you to do. And he's no gadget. He is a person. And he is beautiful. And he is the Holy Spirit. Jeremiah 12 verse 5. If racing against mere men makes you tired, how will you race against horses? Anyone here raced a horse recently? You didn't go to the horse racing, but you raced a horse. Some of you, it was the other way around. If you stumble and fall on the ground, what will you do in the thickets near Jordan? Brent, what are you talking about? You can't run with horses? Exactly. I want you to know that God has given us an appetite for the impossible. Does anyone else here have an appetite for the impossible? Jesus spent three years training his disciples to expect and then to perform the impossible. What are you talking about? Well, last time I checked, walking on water is impossible. Last time I checked, feeding Nearly 10,000 people with women and children with a boy's lunch. It was impossible. Last time I checked, laying hands on the sick and them getting well, it's impossible. Last time I checked, speaking out against the storm and it disappearing is impossible. But these are all the things that Jesus came and trained his disciples to have an appetite for the impossible. To see God do amazing things. Who here has an appetite for chocolate. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Now think of that in spiritual terms about the impossible. That you see a situation that no man can solve and your mouth starts to salivate because you are so excited to see what God can do in that circumstance. When you hear somebody get a bad report at the doctor, you go, Lord, what can you do in this situation? And it wasn't only with Jesus. Jesus just carried on what was happening in the Old Testament. Constantly, God was giving them an appetite for the impossible. Moses, stretch out your rod. And suddenly, the sea split. Has anybody ever seen that? It's impossible. Somebody once said that they figured out how the, how the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. They, they crossed where it was very shallow. And so they said, well, that's even more amazing because God drowned the whole Egyptian army. <laughs> so either way, God is amazing. Hebrews 3, verse 15. I want to ask you a question. Can we limit God's work in our life? Think about that question for a minute. Can we hinder the work of the Holy Spirit in our life? Can we stop God from doing miracles and moving in our life? That's a big question, right? You might think, no, it's impossible because God's going to do what he's going to do. But I want you to know that God has set up a system in this world, and we see it clearly, and I'm going to show you scripture, that he wants us to believe him for what he's going to do. He wants us to step out in faith. He wants us to grab hold of what he has because God's promises are available, but they are not automatic. What does that mean? Well, you go to your, your house tonight and you're going to run a bath. If you don't turn that tap on, it's not going to come out. Am I right? But is the water there waiting for you? Absolutely. How do we turn the tap on to God's kingdom? Through faith, through believing through trusting, through holding. Are you ready to turn some taps on here tonight? Are you ready to say, Lord, would you awaken my heart? Would you awaken my soul? Because I'm tired of hearing about all the cool stuff that you used to do. You know, after being married a few years, some of you might think that the person who you married used to do some things. Do you remember that? When you first met them, maybe the man opened the door for you, ladies. 
and he did all of these things and he, he used to do those things, well, that is not the God that we serve. Because the Bible says that as we get to know him more, it becomes more beautiful. And we go from glory to glory. Who wants a relationship with God like that? I'm not content to leave it in the past. Remember what it says today when you hear his voice. Don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. Verse 19. So we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter his rest. For him to say, do not harden your hearts, that sounds like we have a choice, right? Who thinks we have a choice? God has presented. God has made a table. Jesus has died on the cross. He has shed his blood. All these promises are true in Christ Jesus. All these blessings are available to us. The power is available to us. A spirit-filled life is available to us, but it's not automatic. There's something that we have to do, and that's to respond. If you came up to me and you had a beautiful gift and you held it out and I kept my hands in my pocket, do you know that you are unable to give me the gift that you have? Even though you're holding it out? Even though you have made it available to me? There's something that I have to do and that is to respond, receive, take it. They had it right there. They were right there at the promised land. They had it right there in their sights and they could not trust God's word and God's heart and God's character that he was going to take them in. And because of that, they missed out. And when I read that, I wonder about my own life. Am I limiting the work of God in my life? Am I limiting the power of God in my life? Am I limiting the work of the Holy Spirit in my life? Because it's available, but it's not. It's not automatic. Matthew 13, verse 57 to 58. And they took offense at him. Why? Because they knew his father, so they thought, and his mother, and his brothers, and his sisters. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there. Why? Because of their unbelief. Was there mighty works for Jesus to do? There was. But he couldn't do them. He didn't do them. Because they didn't believe that he could do them. And in my life, whenever I'm reading the Bible, I'm not reading it for somebody else. I'm not thinking about somebody else who isn't living the way that they need to live. I'm thinking about myself. And I'm thinking about all that God has made available. And I'm wondering... If there are things that God has wanted to do in my own life that I have not let him do it. I've given him the hand off. Right? I've said, talk to the hand. Because I did not believe that he was that good. That his power was that great. That he was that awesome. But when I pick up my Bible, I have to tell you, I can't read my Bible without getting an appetite for the impossible. I can't get past realizing how good God is and the amazing things that he wants to do in us and through us. Does anybody else feel like that when they read the Bible? This is the God that we're serving. Tonight we're going to have to make a choice. We're going to have to decide. Like Joshua said, we are going to serve the Lord, but you choose for yourself. As for me and my house, we are going to be believe that God still wants to do the impossible. That the Holy Spirit still wants to empower us. That we want to see the darkness broken and the captive set free and the blind receiving their sight. What will you believe? Upgrade. Who's ever got an upgrade? If you've ever owned a computer, you've had an upgrade at some point. What is an upgrade? Who here knows that the iPhone 5S came out? I knew that because I drove past the AT&T store and saw people sleeping outside. I knew, okay, this must be the day the iPhone comes out. Now imagine this, you have an iPhone 5, and I'm sorry if that is the case. We have prayer down afterwards, please come down. 
You have an iPhone 5 and you've enjoyed this, this phone. It's been a good phone. It's, it's got a camera. It's got a microphone. It does some fancy things. And now the 5S is coming out. What do you expect from that phone if it is an upgrade? That it's better. Nobody in their right mind buys an upgrade that's worse. That's called a, a dud. You take it back and say, give me the old one. Well, I want you to know that this is what the Bible says about the covenant that we are under. It says it's an upgrade. It says it's a better covenant. But I tell you what, when I read it in the Old Testament, I read what God used to do and the amazing stuff that he did. Well, what happened? I bought a phone that used to have a camera and now it doesn't. I bought a phone that used to take video and now it just does text messaging. This is an upgrade. This is an improvement. I was speaking to a friend who said, you know, God used to do these things. He doesn't need to do it anymore. And I said, so what are you telling me? It's like me going to a restaurant and they hand me a thick, thick menu. And page after page after page are the most delicious meals you have ever seen in your life. And it says, out of stock, next to everything. <laughs> and then I turn to the last page where there's dry bread. And it says, available, tonight's special. <laughs> this is how we have treated this new covenant that has been given to us through the blood of Jesus Christ. We just average and normal and we think it's just about getting by and just suffering for the sake of God. We hope we make it through. But the Bible says it is a better covenant. It is a better covenant. Let's read that together. Hebrews 8 verse 6. But now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us. Huh? I want you to read it so you don't think I'm pulling your socks. A what? A far better covenant with God. Based on what? Read it there. Somebody say upgrade, baby. Better promises. Do you realize you have been given an upgrade? Imagine you had a phone that just did text messaging. And then I gave you an iPhone 5S that takes slow motion video. How do you even handle that? And I come to you a year later and I say, man, what are you doing with that phone? You're like, man, well, you know, I've increased my text messaging speed by, you know, I do an extra word a minute. I take that phone away from you and, and, and we'll just leave it there. How disappointing. How disappointing. We have been given a covenant with better promises. Who is pressing in for the better promises? I heard a, a, a story. You may have heard this, a very common story about the cheese and cracker Christian. Who's ever heard that story? This man, he needed to take a journey. And so he had saved up all his money to buy fare on this boat. Anyway, it was going to be a week-long cruise to take him from one side of the world to another. It was a fast boat. <laughs> and so he just had a little money left over. He wasn't sure how he was going to eat on the cruise. So he bought himself some cheese and crackers. And he wrapped it up and he decided this would sustain him for the week that he would be on that ship. Anyway, when he was coming on, the captain met him and shook his hand. He said, welcome to the pride of England, the best ship that we have. And then he went and he un unwrapped his little handkerchief and he ate his cheese and crackers. Every day he would walk past and he would see in the dining hall people feasting and just having an amazing time, enjoying all the luxuries that the boat had to offer. And he'd say, man, I wish I could afford to partake in that. And every day he would go to his room and he'd unwrap his little handkerchief and he would eat his cheese and crackers. Well, this went on for the entire time. He lost some weight. Wasn't very, it wasn't a real pleasurable experience, but he made it to the other side. And when he was leaving, he met the captain, and the captain said, Sir, I never saw you at the dining. I never saw you at the entertainment. I never saw you at anything. Where were you? And he said, Well, actually, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to say, but I didn't have enough money to partake in all of that. And the captain said, Sir, it was part 
of the ticket. It was part of the fair. And how many of us are going to get to heaven and say, I wish that you could have moved in me like you did in Peter. I wish you could have used me like you did Ruth. I wish you could have used me like Nehemiah. And Jesus would say, my brother, my sister, it was part of my blood that I had provided. A better covenant with better promises. But it's available. It's not automatic. It's available for those who will press in. You know, in the Old Covenant, God showed his power by having t Moses turn water into blood. But with Jesus, to show his power, he turned water into wine. In the Old Covenant, a prostitute, there was only one solution for the sin that she had in her life, and that was to be stoned to death. But with Jesus, he ushered in that somebody who was hopeless and lost and deserved death could receive life and have their life changed in an instant. In the old covenant, if you were a leper and you touched somebody, they became unclean, like yourself. But in this new covenant, when a leper was touched by Jesus, they became clean. A better covenant based on better promises. I tell you what, sometimes you get around a, a technology guy who tells you about a piece of technology that you have, and you're like, I didn't know that. Anybody? I didn't even know I could do that. What? I can talk to my phone? It can sing me to sleep at night? I never knew it. Well, I pray that this is what I can be tonight. I can be that little nerd that comes to you and says, do you know how much more your phone can do? Do you know? that you are under a better covenant with better promises. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's carry on. Matthew 11, verse 11 to 12. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there is not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Jesus is saying John the Baptist is greater than Moses? Really? Than Elijah? Why? Because John the Baptist got to point the way, got to show people who Jesus was. He prepared the way for the Son of God. How can we be greater than John the Baptist? Can I tell you why? Are you ready for this? Because we get to have the Holy Spirit of God live inside of us. Because under the old covenant, only the priest could go into the Holy of Holies. In the new covenant, the Holy of Holies comes and lives in us. What are we doing with that? We have a better covenant with better promises. It's available, but it's not automatic. You're getting it. Listen to the rest of this. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and the violent people are raiding it. What does that mean? Let me tell you a story about a violent person who raided the kingdom of God. Her name was Mary, the mother of Jesus, and we spoke about it last week. She comes to Jesus and said, the wine has run out. He's like, it's not my time. She says, do whatever he tells you. Do you know what we don't see Mary saying? And, and once again, I'm not putting down praying the will of God. Jesus taught us to pray the will of God. But then he told us what the will of God was. But Mary didn't come and say, Jesus, if it's your will, will you help us with the wine? No, she was a violent person who came in and raided the kingdom of God and said, wine please. You know who else did that? The Samaritan woman who came to Jesus. And he ignored her. And then he said, I wasn't sent for you. And she said, nice try. And he said, great is your faith. And her daughter was healed. Violent people who will not just be shut up and just back off, who are pressing in and won't let go. And then Jesus taught us, when he taught us about prayer, about a woman who kept coming back and back and back until she got what she was asking. Another example of a violent person who came was Bartimaeus. They said, shut up. 
And he shouted even louder. Because I'm not letting Jesus walk past. I'm getting what I need. I am stepping into that kingdom and I'm grabbing on with both hands. Do we have that attitude? In life, it's considered bad manners when the buffet is opened to go and load up your plate. My mom told me that several times. <laughs> but in the kingdom of God, when Jesus fed the 5,000, it says they ate as much as they wanted. This is the kingdom of God based on a better covenant, based on the blood of Jesus, based on a lamb that would not run dry and run out and we'd have to redo it again because his blood is for eternity and it made us righteous where there was no way for us to be righteous. But we have to receive it. If you came from two parents that were Olympic athletes, who thinks that there would be an expectation for you to be good at sport or anyone? How about the fact that your father runs the universe? <laughs> huh? How about that his spirit is inside of us, powering us, leading us, guiding us? I tell you what, will we live up to our expectation? If I had a father who was a billionaire and amazing at business, everyone would wonder what I'm going to grow up to be. Well, what are we going to grow up to be when our father created the world that we are now in? Are we going to grow up and, and be the potential that is inside of us? Or are we just going to be like that cheese and cracker Christian eating our cheese? Yes, we'll make it to heaven and miss bringing heaven to earth. Right? Acts 10.38 And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. Side note, but I'm not going to go down this, this uh, trail. But the Bible here records... That whatever Jesus needed healing was oppression. Whatever he was healing was oppression from the devil. Sickness, disease, blindness, lameness, all those things that Jesus was doing. What does it say there? Oppression from the devil. Many times when you see the Holy Spirit, you'll read about power. Because you cannot separate the Spirit of God from the power of God. The Holy Spirit is the power of God. When the, when the Holy Spirit came upon Samson... He did some cool stuff, right? He tore off gates and killed people with a donkey jawbone. Why don't they make the movie of that, The Passion of Samson? <laughs> Acts 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, through Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And all the time we hear about the great commission going out yes we need to go from here to here to here and we leave out the very thing that they needed before they could do it and that was to be empowered by the holy spirit how many times have we tried to evangelize without the spirit that enables us to evangelize is it anyone that takes us 10 years to win somebody over and it's only because they're so tired of us begging okay please just stop phoning my house that is not how we see it happening in the Bible. We see people coming, being added daily. People rushing because they've encountered the power, the life-changing power of God. Are we filled with the Holy Spirit? Are we running on His nuclear power? Or are we running on fossil fuels? Right? I'm going to do a demonstration quickly of what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I need an assistant. I need somebody very beautiful, stunning, just leaves you speechless. How about you? <laughs> somebody emailed me and they said, Brent, you need to tell them about chocolate milk. Well, I'm going to tell you about strawberry milk instead. Are you ready for this? This is us, okay? 
This is our lives. This is 2%. Some of us are skim milk. Some of us are... Or the other one. Watch you out for that for me. Thank you. Awesome. This is our lives. Why don't you put a scoop of that in there? Now watch. Are you ready for this? This is us receiving the Holy Spirit. It looks nice. There's a little change, you know? Some of us can now dance. Some of us can do some party tricks. It's nice. But it's not all it's cracked up to be. Where's the rest? What's happened? Where's this power? Where's this change? Where's the fruit? Let me show you something. As we surrender to God, as we give our lives to God, as we follow His commands, do you see what starts to happen? He starts to permeate our lives. He starts to change who we are. And we start to look different. I don't know about you, but I've never mistaken me. Thank you. You're very beautiful, by the way. I've never mistakenly bought strawberry milk for regular milk. Why? Because it looks very different. But I wonder how many times somebody has mistaken me for not having the Spirit of God. And that is a shame. Think about that. If the Holy Spirit is alive and working in our lives, how can pink milk ever look like white milk? How can it be the same? How can somebody with the Spirit of God inside of them look like somebody who doesn't even believe in Jesus? Do we not see that in ourselves when we drive, when we deal with others, when we have problems, when we go through things? We should look different. Do you want to read about some people who look different? Okay. <laughs> Acts 4 verse 8. I'll just write that off too. You don't understand my accent. <laughs> then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people. Verse 13. The members of the council were amazed and they saw the boldness of Peter and John. And they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in scriptures. That gives me great hope. They also recognized them as men who had been. Let me ask you, has anybody recognized that you've been with Jesus? Do you know what they were recognizing? That the same fuel cell that powered Jesus was now powering them. The same spirit that made Jesus who he was was now powering them. When Peter and John are on their way to the temple and there's a lame man, do you know what Peter says to him? Silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have, I give to you. And when he gave him what he did have in the name of Jesus, what happened to that crippled man? He was crippled no more. What we have to give is going to change people's lives if we will first make sure it's changing our lives. If we will allow the Holy Spirit to touch our lives, to transform us, to make us hot pink, I want you to know that people will take note that we have been with Jesus and their lives will be touched and their lives will be transformed. Or they will hate us and try to kill us, one of the two. I don't want to be confused as somebody who doesn't have the Holy Spirit. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is in us. But you can't see him. You can't tell I have him. There's nothing about my life that shows him. That's a problem. He's there, but he's not being used. He's not being allowed to infiltrate. He's not being allowed to speak. He's not being allowed to prompt. He's not being allowed to correct. Because when he says, you know what, that grieves me. That hurts me. I don't like it when you do that. We, like, we turn the TV up louder so we can't hear his voice. Anyone else ever been guilty of that? Come on. You felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit and you did it anyway. You were about to speak badly about somebody and you felt something in your heart say, don't say it. And you said it anyway. Every time we do that, we stop the Holy Spirit from moving, from changing, from mixing and transforming our lives. 
Romans 15, 13. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely. Who wants to be filled completely? Not just mixed a little. With joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. What measure can we have these things in our lives? According to Paul, overflowing. According to Jesus, much fruit. Anyone here who has just overflowing patience, you don't know what to do with it? I'm just so patient. It's just hard for me to get worked up. I'm just so joyful. It's just hard to make me sad. I'm just so trusting in God, you can't stress me out. Is that what it's saying we can have? Then why don't we go for it? Why do we just want the minimum? That's why I don't do well at a buffet. I don't stop at salad. That food that I've never seen in my life, I'm going to eat it. I want to taste everything here, twice. This is what God is asking us to do. He has laid a table before us. He's saying, how much do you want? It's as much as you want. Let's stir up our appetite. Let's stir up our hunger and say, Lord, I want to desire and eat of your table more than anything else. I want you to start making me pink. Awesome. James 4 verse 8. Come close to God and he will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. Your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Well, Brent, that sounds like works. You know, I thought it's by grace. There's nothing we can ever do that is worth receiving the Spirit of God. What a precious gift. It's not about works. It's about positioning. And let me explain it like this. At which point did the prodigal son stop being the son of the father? Do you remember in the story when it said, and he became the prodigal something because he wasn't a son anymore? Do you remember that verse? No, because it's not there. <laughs> At his most darkest hour, he was still the son. He was still the son of that father. Now listen to this. But he could not receive the blessing, the favor, the love, until he positioned himself by the Father. It was always his. It was available to him. That fat calf that they killed, right? The ring that they was waiting for his finger, the sandals for his feet, it was his to have. It was his all along. When he was starving, it was his. When he was rocking it out with his friends, it was his. But until he came into the place and he said, here I am. I don't deserve anything. That was right about the time when he received it. Will you position your heart tonight? Will you position your life? That it doesn't just start with a Bible study and stop with a Bible study. And then we come back and we hear a little bit more. But we go home and we get on our knees and we say, I am not leaving the miracles with Joshua. Joshua. If you can have the faith to stop the sun and the moon, come on, Lord, what can you do in me? If you can use Moses to lead people and change a nation, what can you do with me? If I'm greater than John the Baptist, then, Lord, I want to live up to my potential. And I want to be what you have created me to be. Holy Spirit, if you do all this cool stuff, do it in me. Do it in me. God, I don't want to just hear about all the things that you used to do. I want to flip that no longer on the menu to what's cooking today. And I'm so glad you shared that testimony. Because there are people here that have given up hope that you can have a child, that you can have this, 
that you can have that when it's a longing on your heart. And God says he will give us the desires of our heart. But Brent, you can't say that. People are going to abuse it. I'm just following the example that Jesus did when he fed the 5,000. And they ate as much as they wanted. And then they didn't even believe in him. Think about that. He knew they weren't even going to believe in him. He fed them anyway. Isn't that amazing? Isn't this the God that we serve? Let me tell you what. His goodness draws men to repentance. Taste and see that God is. Wants to hit you with a stick. Is that what it says? Taste and see that God is good. When we taste what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our life, He is so good. You're lonely, I want to tell you about the best friend you could ever have, the Holy Spirit. You need wisdom, I want to tell you about the best friend you could ever have, the Holy Spirit. You're in a bind, you need strength, I want to tell you about the Holy Spirit. You need patience, the Holy Spirit. He produces these things. But will we position ourselves, and will we stop drinking from a dirty well, when we have the finest Voss water. Who was here for that one? Right? Amen. Respond. Thank you.